Hi everyone, this is David from Overthink. Nietzsche's book on the genealogy of morality is one of his most important contributions to the history of ideas. And in a series of four videos, I want to talk about the structure and the arguments contained in this book. And for these videos, I'll be using the 1998 translation by Clark and Swenson. Um, and, you know, other people might prefer different translations, but this is the one that I use whenever I teach Nietzsche. So we'll talk about the preface of the book and about the three parts or treatises that organize the text. Many of Nietzsche's books begin with a preface or with a prologue where Nietzsche reflects on his writing, where Nietzsche talks about how he came to think about the subject matter, or that lay out some methodological principles that will help readers understand the kind of argument that Nietzsche is making. And On the Genealogy of Morality is no exception. In the preface to this text, Nietzsche lays out a couple of principles that I think are a good starting point for thinking not just about the book, but for thinking about what Nietzsche means by the very concept of genealogy, which of course is a concept that has gotten a lot of traction in continental philosophy as a way of thinking about the present in light of its past. Now, Nietzsche begins first and foremost by making the claim that we live in a world that is in dire need of a critique of morality. We need, he says, what he calls a critique of moral values, whereby we ask the question, not of what values we embrace, but why we have come to embrace those values in the first place. In other words, what function do the specific values that we claim to be the core of morality, like altruism, love thy neighbor, humility, chastity, for example, what value do those values serve? And for Nietzsche, the only way to answer that question is through a dive into the descent of moral sentiments and moral principles. Now, the term descent is particularly important and revealing because the term descent was a commonly used noun in the 19th century for thinking about the historical origins of something. So think about descent not only as a going down and going under, like when you descend into the underworld, but think about it also as a backwards movement. When you descend backwards in time to find the original articulation of a thing, in order to then follow its progression over time, its descent over time. And so when Nietzsche says that we need to look into the descent of morality, what he means is that we need to look for the origins of morality. And the term descent is also important because it is a term that was commonly used by the new defenders of Darwinian evolution for thinking about evolution itself. So the two principles with which Nietzsche begins are one, that we need a critique of moral sentiments or moral values, and secondarily, that the only way to get this critique is by looking at the descent of morality, at its origins. Although Nietzsche's preface covers a ton of subjects about language, about his own childhood, about the way in which other people have written about morality, there is one specific section that I want to focus on here, and that is section seven. The preface has eight sections. They're, usual, they're each about a page long, so it's a relatively short text. But section seven is particularly important for thinking about what it is that Nietzsche is going to try to do in this text. Now, in section seven... Nietzsche differentiates his own genealogical approach to morality, think about the title of the book, Genealogy of Morality, from other historical ways of thinking about morality, and especially approaches that he sees as somewhat similar, but ultimately insufficient in comparison to his own. And here he mentions one particular thinker by name, and that is the German um, moralist or philosopher, Paul Ray. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Nietzsche's biography, you may know that Paul Ray is the man, he was a close friend of Nietzsche, and he was the man with, with whom he had a really bizarre love triangle involving Nietzsche, Ray, and uh, Lou Salome. Either way, Nietzsche begins by arguing that in Paul Ray's works, because Paul Ray wrote a book about the origin of moral sentiments, we see the importance of thinking about morality historically. 
So he gives some kind of credit to Paul Ray for bringing a historical eye to the object of moral sentiments. But he ultimately thinks that the way in which Paul Ray historicizes morality is not just counterintuitive, but actually counterproductive. So let me say a little bit about what Paul Ray does in his work as a foil for what Nietzsche is then going to try to do, which is different. Now, Paul Ray, in his book on the uh, on the origin of, of morality or moral sentiments, makes the argument that our moral feelings, so the way in which we care for one another, the way in which we have empathy for one another, ought to be understood in a neo-Darwinian lens or a proto-Darwinian lens in which our morality is a trait that originated a long, tar- a long time ago in pro-social sentiments like altruism. And those sentiments, which were originally quite rudimentary, quite basic, over time get worked by natural selection and they get perfected over time until we arrive at the present, where that particular trait reaches its most perfect iteration in contemporary morality. Now, notice two things about Paul Ray's approach. The first thing is that he basically takes Darwin's way of thinking about biological uh, evolution and organic evolution and just applies that to the world of morality. So in the same way that species evolve over time by changing their um their traits, so too morality changes by certain things, certain sentiments getting worked on through natural selection. So that's the first thing that we take a Darwinian framework in race work and apply it to morality. The second thing that is important for Nietzsche about race approach is that it really focuses on pro-social sentiments, thereby establishing a continuity between the present, where we understand morality to be pro-social, and the origin of morality, which is fundamentally the same, pro-social sentiments, caring for other people, it's just that it's evolutionarily, from an evolutionary perspective, less sophisticated. And it's only with the addition of time and natural selection that A becomes B, but the entire history of morality is the history of feel-good sentiments that we naturally have innately for one another. So there is a focus here on the positive, feel-good aspects of human nature, getting worked on over time, and becoming better and better as time passes. So Nietzsche looks at Ray's work and says, again, I'm happy that he's historicizing morality. That's already a major advance over other theories of morality that presuppose that morality is made up of these absolute hook in the sky, moral principles that are eternal and never changing. But I dislike that he's just taking that Darwinian framework and applying it to morality and only focusing on these positive aspects of human nature that end up rationalizing contemporary moral values without truly critiquing them. Now, there is a specific passage in section seven where Nietzsche talks about Ray that I want to read and talk about in some detail, because this is where we really see Nietzsche putting his finger on the difference between purely evolutionary accounts of morality and genealogical accounts of morality, which is what he wants. And here, just keep in mind that he's going to call Paul Ray's approach English hypothesis mongering into the blue. That's somewhat of a mouthful, but I just want to flag it because it's going to become very important for thinking about what Nietzsche is trying to say about Ray. So let me read from the text. This is page six, section seven of the preface. He says, My wish in any case was to turn so sharp and disinterested an eye in a better direction, the direction of the real history of morality, and to warn him, i.e. Paul Ray, while there was still time against such English hypothesizing into the blue. It is, of course, obvious which color must be a hundred times more important to a genealogist of morality than blue, namely gray, which is to say that which can be documented, which can really be ascertained, which has really existed. In short, the very long 
difficult to decipher hieroglyphic writing of the human moral past. This was unknown to Dr. Ray. Now, this is a really tricky passage because Nietzsche is using colors as a stand-in for two different ways of thinking about morality. One is the approach that Ray takes, this English hypothesizing into the blue, and the other one is the gray hypothesizing that a genealogist must do in order to truly uncover the descent of moral values. But what can this possibly mean? What does it mean to approach the world of the past in a blue versus a gray way? And also, why does he call it English, given that Paul Ray was German like him? So for thinking about this last question, we should just clarify that the reason that he calls it English hypothesizing into the blue is because he associates evolution with the English, with people like Darwin. So even though Paul Ray is a German philosopher writing about morality, he ultimately classifies him as a as an English thinker because of his mode of thinking itself. Now, concerning the previous question about colors, I think here we need to specify or rather speculate a little bit. So think about blue as a color. What does it signify? What does it represent? What does it symbolize? When I think about blue, I think about openness. I think about airiness. I think about the sky, obviously. And there is something ideal or idealistic about blue. And I think that's precisely what Nietzsche means, that when these English or English-inspired or influenced thinkers write about morality, they just start throwing hypotheses into the blue. Um, They're just throwing ideas out that are not rooted in the truth of the matter, in that which can be documented, in that which can be traced, in the archive of the past. But more importantly, they also throw these hypotheses into the blue in the sense that they are idealistic constructions of human nature, or rather they present human nature in an idealistic way. They present it as much more ideal and positive and pro-social than it really is. So whereas Ray is going to look for the history of morality in our already positive sentiments of altruism and empathy and pro-sociality in the past, Nietzsche is going to look back at the past and say, that's not really where morality comes from. It actually comes from much darker, i.e. gray, corners of human nature. It will come from our will to power. It will come from our desire for domination. And it will definitely come from our desire for vengeance and brutality. And so when he says that there is something bluish about traditional approaches and something grayish about genealogical ones, I think this is what he has in mind. Another point here. When Nietzsche says that the color gray is much more important for the genealogist because it refers to that which can be truly documented, I also think about the grayness of dust in in an archive or in a library where you have to dust things off in order to discover things that you didn't know before. And that means that genealogy, and I like that the color of the cover itself is gray, very appropriate. It means that a genealogical investigation of any object will take you into really unexpected gray areas. And that means areas where things are not either yay or nay, things are not black or white, they're gray, there are gray areas, and where things are also a little bit muddy originally. And so that's one way to think about the very nature of genealogy, that it is an approach to the past that is not looking for ideal narratives that make us feel good about human nature. It's not looking for continuous narratives rooted in linear progress where the same thing remains the same, but in a more perfect form. Rather, it's going to be a series of mutations and errors without a logical order. Now, I'll end here on this note, but just keep in mind that, therefore, the title of the book, A Genealogy of Morality, must not be confused, as sometimes it is when people begin reading Nietzsche, with a history or an evolutionary account of morality. What Nietzsche is giving us is a grayish rather than a bluish 
dive into the past of our moral present.